Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for turning up early after I heard a very exciting banquet last night. Um, thank you, Brendan, for the introduction. Um, I'm a lecturer in chemistry, as Brendan said, in um, DIT in Kevin Street, which is just uh, five minutes around the corner. And I'm interested in using technology in, in teaching. Um, and I've done a, some work over the last few years uh, in, in that regard. So what I wanted to talk today about is the flip lecture. And um, in meeting Dara um, before, uh, you know, in planning this talk, uh, I'm a chemist and, and we thought we'd do an experiment. And the experiment was rather than me coming in here and talking to you for 40 minutes about the flip lecture, we would actually have a flip lecture. Um, so it, um, it's the first time I've done this, so um, it'll be interesting to see. But the idea was that um, you as my students were to watch um, a video before you came to the lecture and then this time we have together we will be much more open um, discursive uh, platform just as a real uh, flipped lecture um, is, is supposed to be so the idea really is that you are going to experience a flipped lecture um, for the next 40 minutes um, and hopefully see for yourselves some of the pros plenty of cons um, and then, from your own perspective, uh, bring it back into your own practice, either as uh, somebody who's teaching directly or somebody who's supporting um, students or lecturers. So, hopefully, um, the intended outcomes are we'll have to leave here with some idea of what a flip lecture is, which I think would be the main outcome if I was to just talk to you for, for um, the next 40 minutes. What I'd like to tease out more, though, is obviously this is a much more diverse audience than I'm used to speaking to. I'm used to speaking to an audience of academics about this kind of thing. So we all have a very single mindset that is the students are lazy and have to do all the work and we're amazing and just, you know, that's, that, that's, that's the audience I'm used to. So you may have to bring me down a little bit. Um, but what I really am hoping to get is uh, in the discussions we have, um, uh, I think, somewhat talk about the opportunities. Um, I think we'll start off with that just to say in our minds um, how, how good we think this is uh, and, and what it's, wh wh whether it's worth the effort. But I think much more importantly are the challenges that this approach brings. So uh, I'm interested in your perspective on that um, and um, talking about how we can deliver this content. I, I gave you a video on YouTube that you had to watch. What are the, what are the options about delivering this content? What kind of things should we think about? Um, and I think this audience in particular will have a lot of insight in that regard. And hopefully you'll leave here and have some thoughts about if I was to implement this in my role, either directly as a lecturer or as helping somebody support this, uh, what kind of things do I need to think about? Okay, so last night I did a screen grab and 202 people had watched the um, video, uh, which explained um, what flip lectures were, the idea of flip lectures, my own implementation of flip lectures, um, and, and some of the analysis of that, and then some questions that were to lead on into the um, presentation. So I'm going to look around the room now, and I, I, I'll just tell you, if I was asked to watch a video before a conference, I wouldn't. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> But I do need to know, because we're at a critical juncture now, I do need to have, and you can just, if you don't want to show off and be the A student, you can just kind of put your hand up here like this. But I do need to get a sense from the audience as to whether you did watch the video. So if you could just raise your hands. You're all SWATs. A students. A students. Okay, that's good. So um, from the point of view of, of organization, what I would say is that this is, I, I'm guessing that more than half the um, class have watched the video, which, which means what we're going to do now is feasible. If that hadn't happened, I guess I would have had to go back to some traditional chalk and talk and maybe just given you a brief overview of what was in the video. I should say that the students in the back of the class uh, didn't generally watch the video, so um, <laughs> but we're, we're, you know, and, and you were late too. Um, <laughs> okay, so we're going to have three um, breakout sessions. I have 10 minutes here, but I just said the timings and they'll have to be about eight minutes. But the idea will be that um, what I want you to do in, in a large lecture theatre, one of the criticisms of flip lectures is it won't work in large lecture theatres. <clears throat> and I want to show you some of the ways that we could maybe get around that. Getting students in groups of three in large lecture theatres is very beneficial because it means nobody is left out at either end. The three people can talk together in a little huddle. So what I'd like you to do is be in groups of three um, or four if you want to turn around, uh, but ideally groups of three 
for these <coughs> discussion activities. So if you're in a group of three and one or two per people haven't, so here um, the student support officer hasn't watched the video, so he will be or she will be lost. Um, so the, the other two have to tell him or her what, what the idea of a flip lecture is. So spend two or three minutes on that. If you've already, all, all members of the group have already watched the uh, video, so here we're all blue now, uh, you, can, you can graduate straight ahead into the main activity, which is um, let's start off and be positive and optimistic and bright. What are the opportunities do you think the flip lecture approach, uh, approach has? So I'm going to time it for about 10 minutes, and after 10 minutes, we'll get some points back from the audience. And I, I'm really keen to hear points back, especially from your perspective, from your own role in your own um, environment, uh, what you think it is. In other words, I, I know all the great things about a lecture being flipped, um, about the flipped approach. I'm interested in the other, other areas too. So if you can wear your hat or whatever your role is in your current position, that would be very beneficial. Okay, so 10 minutes. Up you go. Okay, so I'm going to uh, call a halt there. Are we students? Shh. I have to not be polite when talking to adults and just treat you like my students. Um, okay, so I'm going to cut that short, a little bit short of 10 minutes because um, the activity two and three are more about giving out and people like to spend more time in the giving out aspects. But in general, we have roving mics here. Um, does anybody, uh, what, what I'd like is basically a couple of points from the audience. If you could just maybe say your own perspective, whether you're a lecturer or a student support officer or something, and one or two things that your group thought um, was interesting. So who wants to start? Be brave. Um, the group that the microphone is standing beside, so the gray t-shirt with the yellow, the yellow, um, just to your, yeah, you, yeah, you know, you know it's you, you know it's you, just here, sorry, to your left, to your right. Uh, I was uh, one of those that haven't watched the video, uh, so I should see it in the back probably, uh, but I did get it explained, and uh, it sounded great. Looks uh, like a, a great way to, uh, to prepare the lecture and go through it. Uh, there's all this uh, uh, room for a but in everything. Uh, not, not a but, but uh, <laughs> uh, if uh, the students that I work with uh, in Norway are students that they are not confident and uh, showing up on the lecture could be, uh, could be hard. And, and maybe if uh, they um, uh, wasn't prepared, they still would show up because there might be something there for me. But if they knew that they... I, I'm just going to cut you short there because they, they are, there's two points there that I want to bring up in the next section. So just, just to preempt that, because we're a little bit short on time, I okay. just want to get some other feedback. But there are two <laughs> points that I really wanted to pick up on, so thank you. Yeah. yeah. And, any, other, any other comment? Yeah, here. Hi, Emma Murphy. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in DCU, and I, I teach as well. Um, so we were thinking that that it's really it's a UDL way this flipped classroom because uh, students can process the information in their preferred modality at home. So when they come into the lectures, they can participate. They can work with the lecturer. The lecturer will have more of an idea of the challenges that they face with the material. But importantly, they've been able to set it up you know, read, hear, whatever way they want to interact with the material, they can do that at home. So, yeah, so we, we really thought that it was, yeah, it's, the, it's, it's definitely supports UDL. Okay. Um, thank you. When Dara asked me to speak for this, I said, I don't even know what UDL is, and he said, well, this is doing it. So, yeah, that, I think that kind of, that kind of um, mirrors that. I, I had um, on my, um, on, on my um, <coughs> website, I, I put up these questions that I was going to ask. I said I, I was going to ask, give this talk, and um, uh, I was terrified that nobody would give any answers. So I asked people, could you, could you put comments up as to what you think the answers could be? But these are answers from other educators. So if you go to that website, you'll see the first post there. 
there's a lot of commentary there if you want to either read it or continue on that discussion. Um, but just some I'll, I'll highlight. Uh, the first one is um, a sc school teacher um, <coughs> who is using it to flip her um, uh, chemistry classes. Um, so she's talking about student inclusion. She especially, I think it's on the next slide, she mentions um, uh, especially beneficial for students with dyslexia um, and the very broad range of students um, that she has in a school classroom, she finds it very beneficial. Um, somebody with a management background uh, mentions about greater efficiency. That's something we'll talk about later maybe. <coughs> um, uh, I like this one. We are just fixed with this notion of having to shoehorn um, our lecture content into 50, nice 50 minute blocks, um, which just because the timetable says so, um, but it gets around that. Um, people to work in teams, the emphasis is covering the material. Uh, one lecturer who's just um, um, beginning to do this this year said it's challenging to redesign the course, so he's really thinking about well, actually, how, in terms of curriculum design, how am I delivering this? Fits better with the information is everywhere age. In other words, we're moving from a situation where um, information isn't king anymore. How to find information and use information is. And this is that school teacher again um, who mentioned um, students with dyslexia. Okay, so that's the good thing. And I should say I'm not particularly a strong advocate of flip lectures. I do believe they have potential, but you don't feel, don't feel, you don't have, you're not offending me if you say bad things about it, um, which is the next part. So for this second activity, um, we're going to be a little bit more pragmatic. And in the actual implementation, and I've already heard some feedback and some comments here um, about the challenges uh, that this approach will take. Again, from your own approach, what do you think the challenges to this um, approach are? And be ready either to respond to how you may deal with those challenges, the ones you raise, or if somebody else raises one as in the feedback, how you may ha have you any ideas for that? And again, I, I have some thoughts from my own practice that we could use as well. So off you go, 10 minutes. Okay, so we'll, we'll uh, resume back now. <laughs> Students. <laughs> it's great that I have to shut you up. I never have to shut up my own students. They're more than happy to stop talking. Um, okay, so again, I think this is really the, the, um, the nub of the issue because uh, obviously um, everything sounds great and looks wonderful, but actually in day-to-day -day reality of delivering um, alternative approaches to the traditional lecture, there's a lot more time and work involved. One question from the audience that was interesting, just to clarify, um, people have been giving, you know, work to do before lectures for decades, um, and the flipped learning network made a definition to clarify what flipped learning actually is. Flipped learning is not where pre-reading material or pre-lecture material is given, and then the lecture stays the same for 50 minutes. In other words, the pre-activity hasn't done anything to create an active classroom. Flip learning is where you are using the pre-lecture activity or pre-learning material to radically alter what's happening in the classroom. Hopefully, just like we have radically altered a typical conference presentation here, where you're actually allowed to do some talking. So I think it's just an interesting um, dynamic, because very often people will say, oh, I've been flipping for years. And maybe they have, but it, it, it involves the changing of the classroom as well as pro providing the material beforehand. OK, I, I just can't hear when the microphone is, um, uh, when people are talking to the microphone, so I'm going to wander around as well so I can stand close. Hopefully this should work. Um, so who wants to say some challenges? I feel like a game, quiz game show. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Sjeta Ilknalag from uh, Norway. Uh, we work. Uh, I, I also flip my own classes when I teach about universal design, which I uh, do sometimes. And what I see as the main challenge is that the the risk for for uh, that the, it's, it's being crap altogether. Because if you have an ordinary lecture, you can read your audience and you can change at at the time. But if you if you make a bad flip classroom, I think it's even worse than making a bad uh, lecture. Uh, the risk is higher and you have to be a very good communicator and you also have to be able to read the group very well and uh, that is very difficult for some and I think that the flipping the classroom is not for everyone. 
Yeah, so I think just to reiterate the point, uh, if it goes wrong, it can essentially go very wrong. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting. One of the things, um, clickers, I think, have done huge damage for education innovation because people were sold clickers as this amazing thing that was going to radically change everything. And then lecturers bought into this and they hauled around bags of clickers every classroom and they didn't work or they didn't, you know, they were oversold. So, yeah, I think we do need to be realistic about what the uh, approach can have. Um, uh, to, probably doesn't need training or some sort of format. I think th the appeal of flip lectures is that it does provide some kind of overarching structure. Of course, there is a professionalism in there on the part of the lecture, but um, yeah, that's a good point, one I hadn't thought of. Any Anybody else? Yeah. Um, hi, I was going to, uh, Trevor from DIT. Uh, just say that I think the learning space can probably be a barrier at times because uh, just knowing the seating in DIT sometimes is fixed spacing and a flexible learning space would definitely lend itself. So uh, like a space that simply has chairs that can move around so it can accommodate the group work would lend itself. So I don't know if that's been a barrier in your own experience. Yeah, so uh, uh, w one of the things we were keen for to do here was to keep the uh, arrangement. Uh, they were very kind and we're going to actually make little group tables and things, but I wanted to keep the arrangement to show that it is possible to have group discussion, get around to the um, people in the lecture theatre. Now, I, I teach in a tiered lecture theatre where, um, I mean, sometimes I'm climbing over seats, kind of getting around. It, it, it is a barrier. Realistically, lecture theatres are still being built, even though we know all these issues, and they're still being built in traditional ways, so it's probably not one that we're going to overcome. That's why I think the, the groups of three work well. Uh, people like Eric Mazura doing things like peer instruction, where it's formalizing um, uh, in-class work. Clickers there, I mentioned, obviously allow somewhat, some kind of feedback from the, from the audience as a whole. But yeah, it's certainly an issue to consider. Yeah. Sorry, hogging it down this side. Um, I'm, an, I'm an international student. I paid a hideous amount of money to come to England to get a degree. Um, I expect to be lectured, but you're now saying to me, I've got to do all the pre-reading, I come into the class and then I sit with my colleagues who know about as much as I do and we talk about something, where's the value for money? Yeah, no, this is a very, um, a, a very commonly raised, not, not from my students, but this is a very commonly raised um, uh, criticism, I think, of any alternative method to teaching the masses. Um, and uh, it's a case, I think, personally, I think it's a case of sticking to your guns and, and um, showing by doing, in other words, showing to that student that you're actually getting an output, uh, explaining the broader skill set in terms of group discussion, group presentation, or whatever you're building in. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's, I think international students especially, uh, when people are paying, there is, that, there is that perception that they come to be taught. Um, but I think I suppose it's a case of explaining the difference between school and university. I'm so going to keep talking while I walk around to the other side of the room. One comment um, was, um, was in, I just, it just left my mind, so um, no, it's gone. Anybody, anybody over? Yeah. Um, I'm a lecturer, but also a disabilities uh, coordinator. Um, this didn't come up in our little discussion, but um, just thinking about uh, students who are maybe on the autism spectrum, you know, students who don't do well in groups, maybe not necessarily on the autism spectrum, but uh, the type, the learning style might not work for um, a fair number of students. And so I'm thinking about how you might get over that. So you mean learning style in terms of that they don't like talking to other people? Right, difficulties like um, interacting with other people, uh, especially on short notice or just for a very limited period of time and you know, pressure. I mean, in my own case, I have students who just will not, who refuse to, um, for shyness or other reasons, don't like that. It's not something I'm going to force. I'm not going to force them to, you know, I'll, I'll encourage them to sit together, but I'm not going to go to one person in the room and say, you must go and sit with that other person. If they're happy working through, like in my work, I give them problem sets and we discuss that. If they're happy doing that, for me, that's okay. Uh, perhaps I should push them a bit more, I don't know. But um, in general, the, 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 the lecture just flows along, people are working in groups of three. If someone's working on their own, they're still doing work. For, for me, that's okay. I'm not sure that's the right thing, but that's what I think. Yeah. We probably should go on. Any, any burning? Yeah. yeah. We have the spokesman here. He's the 
determined that I'm going to speak. <laughs> um, just to say, in fact, Jerry actually brought up the same point as this gentleman, and he mentioned it in relation to uh, students with Asperger's in particular, that they might find that very difficult in a group situation if other members weren't contributing or say they didn't arrive on time, they didn't do their work, you know, and there was a lack of control in the situation. Also, and maybe to think about the assessments, how do you meet your learning outcomes? Do you have to start rethinking how to do that um, if you're d using this particular method and you're using it a lot? And also the amount of preparatory work for both the lecturer finding all of this material and to put up in advance for the students to engage in and also for the students themselves because they have to engage pre the lecture and then also work their way through. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really succinct summary. Um, on the preparatory material, that's actually the point I wanted to raise. We were discussing over there a kind of a low-cost version that people do. I obviously make screencasts purposely for my lectures. A low-cost version of that is where somebody records their lecture from the previous year, and then the next lecture they use that recording as a flip lecture. It's not ideal, but it's certainly the first um, step. I think the student workload issue is huge, actually, and it's something that we forget about, because I require my students, obviously, to do some work before they come to the lecture, and then um, they're working in the lecture. What I tell them is that each module has a certain number of learning hours, and what I'm doing is structuring their study time. So this is time that they would have, hopefully, have spent studying after the lecture, but they're doing it beforehand now. On the assessment, um, we'll talk about this, I think, the, I'll just have it here. So these are just, I'll, I'll just hit some more of your points as I go through this. Um, so yeah, large classes are one issue. Um, the potential student workloads. Uh, so on the assessment, what I do is I give students, after they watch the pre-lecture activity, they do a quiz, and that quiz, the combination of all those quizzes are worth 10% for their module. And the final question in that quiz is, what did you find difficult about the content this week? And then we can build that into the, into the lecture. So it's awarding some value towards um, their, their, their pre-lecture work. Um, a little bit late on time, so keep going. Um, yeah, so uh, again, this is an educator talking about the tiered lecture theatres, but then somebody else came in and said he was able to do it with 150. So uh, I, I think it's it's probably comes back to your point about, um, about uh, training. Okay, and the final, we won't have 10 minutes, I'm afraid, but what uh, I obviously made a nice screencast. There's you know, good principles about e-learning e design and so on. What kind of general issues in maybe about um, four minutes, what kind of general issues do you think um, we should consider in rolling this out. In other words, it's not just the pre-lecture material. There has to be a whole suite of um, um, delivery um, in, in terms of bringing this to students. If you were to implement this, what kind of activities do you think, or what kind of um, resources do you think the students would need? Um, and I think particularly from your perspective in this audience, uh, what, what kind of things do you think we should consider? So I'm sorry, we're a little bit late on time, but if we go for maybe four minutes um, chat and then we'll have feedback. Okay, just because we're short on time, I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut that um, short. So, what I wanted to show you is here, just these are some of the resources that I would um, use, and um, I'd be happy to discuss over coffee anybody um, later on if you want to um, inform me of some alternative approaches, I'd be very glad to hear them. Um, obviously, the whole idea of flipped lecturing is that it's built on in-class activities, so we need to decide what the students are actually going to do in the class. Here I decided we were going to have three breakout sessions where you would talk about things. We need to think about, well, how are we going to make sure that people are talking about things and not the banquet last night? Uh, that's something you're going to have to build into the design. Um, peer instruction, I mentioned, is something that um, Eric Mazur has championed. This is essentially where you have structured activities where the students talk to each other, um, trying to uh, inform each other about a particular topic or people do group work, group presentations. In order to facilitate that, we have to have some kind of pre-lecture preparation. You can use either prepared screencasts or a lecture recording, as I mentioned. I like the students to have something to do when they're watching those videos, so they get a little printout that they can fill in as they're watching the videos. It just makes it a little bit more active. Uh, there's questions that they do as well, so they have to pause and work on that. In total, the time the students would spend for two hours preparation, two hours lecture time, would be about half an hour, 45 minutes. So it's not a very large amount of time outside of the lecture. And then to reward and give value to that pre-lecture work and also to incentivize them to do it, the students get a pre-lecture quiz as well. 
I'm afraid I'm not going to get feedback here, if you don't mind, just because we're short on time, um, and I know we're a little bit late already. So I'm just going to conclude with um, some thoughts. This whole approach, I think, is not um, just uh, in vogue. I, t I do believe it's grounded in cognitive load theory, which basically says we're throwing too much information at students in a 50-minute slot. I like the idea that there are multimodal forms of delivery, and there's just a lot more opportunity to interact with students and for students to work with each other. I do think we need to be realistic about the challenges, significant development workload. Um, we need an assessment, I think, if you want students to do this, because students like us all are very busy people and they're going to prioritise based on need. And if you do not um, uh, reward this work with some form of assessment, it's unlikely that people are going to engage. You are all amazing students because you all engaged without any reward. Uh, and I think the point of a student workload is one that's forgotten, but um, we need to consider. If you want to have a look at my website where that conversation is ongoing, please do. I'd be delighted to, um, to share any more thoughts there, hear your thoughts. But other than that, I'm, um, I've got one minute, 20 seconds for questions, so thank you. So any, any f final questions or remarks or, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll. Well, I'm very active today, I assume. <laughs> um, a friend of mine, he is teaching basic uh, ICT at the University of Trondheim. And he has a flipping classroom with 300 students. And he says that, well, what, what actually happens is that a lot of students, they, they just don't show up. Uh, they are unprepared and they don't want to get part of these discussions. And what he is telling me is that, well, he really wants to, uh, to have 40 or 50 of these students to be very, very, very good students. And uh, if the rest is average, well, they are just average. They can have the basics material. And he continues to flip and, and uh, the quality of the 40 students present is very high. And the rest of the students, well, Perhaps they will pass, and nothing more than that. And I think that's a very important perspective to, to have in mind what, what actually happened when we flip such a big, big group. And uh, I think it's very interesting to learn from what, what he has been doing, because his students are very, very good right now, but just a part of the students. One thing I'd say about very good students is I believe our current system isn't... Um, but very often we think about... Um, the less able students in class and what we can do to support them. I believe our current education model is not good for very good students. Um, they're, they're come true, uh, and this, um, maybe I shouldn't be on the record here, but this idea that students, um, that, that learning in university is different to learning in school, really when you look at exam papers it isn't. Um, and I think we need to be honest about how we can challenge very good students as well as support students who need, need a little bit more attention. Okay, I should probably pass over to the next speaker. So um, <laughs> thank you very much everybody.